If you have a copy of God's Word, Julia and MJ and Josh have read for us our passage this morning that is found in James chapter 2, starting in verses 14, going through verse 26. If you would take your copy and turn there with me. Uh, There is a church outside of Chicago in Naperville, Illinois, and the church at the 25th anniversary of the church was finally able to raise the funds to install bells in the belfry. And for 25 years, it had been a vacant spot and they had not been able to raise the funds. And so it was a great celebration in which they were able to fill that vacant spot that for the last 25 years had a cross in it and there was great fanfare to it. But at 12 o'clock, you will not hear the chiming of the hour. You will not hear hymns play through those bells. And it isn't a city ordinance that prohibits that. It is actually that those bells do not have clappers in them. The bells, while they look authentic from a distance, are actually fake. It is not a bell unless the bell rings. And these bells do not ring. And in many respects, we're going to come to this passage that has been read for us this morning that is reminding us of what the authentic sound of our faith is. You know, you, as a believer, can spiritually be like these bells in the sense that you can have the outward trappings of authentic faith. You can be in the right place, say the right things. But the sound of true, authentic faith does not come forth from you. And James is speaking to us today, and there is a warning to us that we must heed. There's a caution that we must hear. What is the sound of authentic faith? Well, it is a faith that works. It is a faith that rings, and it rings with action. It rings with deeds. In James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, we come to the section of Scripture that is arguably the most significant section. It is certainly the most familiar section in the entire book of James. It has been a section of Scripture that has been up for much debate throughout church history. It comes, I think, very importantly after these 13 verses that come before it that that talk very clearly in James chapter 2 verses 1 through 13 that faith is incompatible with favoritism. So there's a sense in which James is saying this isn't what faith looks like. So when bias and prejudice and discrimination it, it overrides our heart, this is incompatible with true authentic faith. Now he's going to move on to a more positive explanation. What then does true authentic faith sound like? What is the ring of true authentic faith? What does it look like in your life and in my life? Let's go over this real quickly here. Starting in verse 14, he starts with a question. The question is, what good is it to claim to have faith without works? And he gives an example in verses 15 through 16. Say you have a person And this person in all of his or her piety sees someone and they do not have food, they do not have clothing, and says to that person, oh, be warm and well fed. The conclusion that James draws is clear that faith that is all sentiment, all words, but without works, this is dead faith. Now, James anticipates that there's going to be a person in the class that always raises his or her hand. And so instead of the person raising their hand, James anticipates that there's going to be one that raises his hand with a question. And so verse 18 anticipates the question. Here's the hand raised. Well, what, what, what if this? What if you have someone, James says, who says, well, I have faith, and another says, I have deeds? What if somebody separates the two sides of the same coin, faith and works? James counters this question by saying, show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. Even demons, James say. James says, believe that there's one God. And even demons actually shudder in holy fear. Here is the implication. James says, even those who are, the, uh, the, are not believers, certainly those who are hell-bent upon thwarting the work of God, demonic activity, even they shudder in holy fear knowing that there is a God. But they don't have true saving faith. And so again, he comes back to this theme in verse 20, and he states it so clearly, your faith without deeds is useless. Then he gives us two illustrations, two powerful illustrations. 
from the Old Testament, one of a patriarch and one of a prostitute. And he starts in verse 21. He says, think about Abraham for a second, a second here. Abraham was considered righteous by God, and he obeyed God. And how did he obey God? Because God said to him, do the unthinkable. Offer your only son, Isaac, the one you promised, son Isaac. And, and Abraham, in the midst of this unthinkable act, goes to the place where he is willing to do anything and everything that God asked him to do. And in that moment, God uh, brings the angel. He does not strike his son. But Abraham's faith was proven true by his actions. It's the example of the patriarch. Then in verse 25, we move from the patriarch of the Old Testament faith, one of them, to the prostitute that is very memorable, uh, memorable in the book of Judges and others, and that's the example of Rahab. And the story of Rahab is that Rahab is considered righteous in her works, hiding spies and thwarting the military personnel that comes to try to find the spies that come into the promised land. So he comes to the end with a summary, and this is a summary, a spirit must have uh, the spirit must be present in the body to be alive so faith without deeds is dead and here is James's word to us now I want us to see in this passage here as we see this broad overview of what James is saying I want us to see that there is a question to heed in this passage and there is a principle to hear there is a question for us to consider and there's a principle for us to to hear. And the first question is this, Paul and James, friend or foe? Paul and James, friend or foe? The Apostle Paul and the author of the book of James, are they friends or are they foes? Now, throughout the years, you have these historic enemies. You have the Hatfields and the McCoys. You have the Capulets and the Montagues from uh, Romeo and Juliet. You have Leno and Letterman. You have Wiley Coyote and the Roadrunner. I mean, these historic kind of feuds throughout life. Now, throughout church history, To add to these feuds, you have people that put Paul and James as enemies, as opposites in some respects. At the very outset of this sermon series, I told you that Martin Luther, the great German reformer, he would come to this section of Scripture here, and he would see in this section of Scripture a contradiction to what Paul said in the New Testament, especially Romans and Ephesians and Galatians. James Uh, for Luther the Reformer was placed in the very end of the German translation that Luther did. So the last book of the German translation of the Bible is the book of James because James to Luther was an epistle, in his words, of straw. Now, why would he say that? Well, as a reformer, he was holding up a recovery of sola fide, of, of faith alone and grace alone in Christ alone, that salvation only comes in Christ alone, through his grace alone, by faith alone. And then James would say in James chapter 2 verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. The whole calling card of the Reformation was faith alone, in Christ alone, through his grace alone, understood only by Scripture alone. So you have all of these solas, you have all of these alones, and then all of a sudden, James says here, you're justified by works and not by faith alone. So you can imagine that Luther would read this and and think about Ephesians chapter 8, or Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 9, where Paul would come to the, the clear call, for by grace you've been saved through faith, And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. Are these contradictory points or are they complementary emphases? This is an important question. It is a theological question that I want us to think about historically and I want us to think about contextually here. So what do I mean by that? Well, it's important to understand that the book of James is written before uh, Paul's epistles. Uh, the book of James is 
and it's very difficult to pin down the exact day, time, week, all that. So we have a range of maybe 40 A.D. to 45 A.D. The earliest letter that we have of the Apostle Paul would be his first letter to the church at Thessalonica. So 1 Thessalonians is written at least five years later, maybe ten years later. I think that's really important because you need to understand, and we need to understand under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, James isn't sitting there with his copy of the book of Ephesians, and he's refuting it. I mean, he did not have Ephesians. He did not have Romans. He did not have the book of Galatians. So this isn't a rebuttal. So that's a historical consideration. But I want you to see real clearly in the book of James a contextual consideration. If you follow the book of James and you don't understand what kind of works he's talking about, in comparison to the kind of works Paul talks about, you will always see these as contradictions. But when you understand the context that Paul was writing to, and you understand the context of what James is talking about, you will see them not as contradictions, but as complementary emphases. What do I mean? The works that James is talking about in this letter are works that come from the heart of one who has been transformed by the gospel. So these are works of love. In chapter 1 and in chapter 2, you see this emphasis again and again. This is individuals who have received the implanted word, who have received the word of truth, the gospel. Out of receiving the gospel, being saved by faith alone, in Christ alone, through his grace alone, so there are works that emerge there's fruit of salvation and so that fruit in chapter one is caring for those that are in need widows and orphans in chapter two he comes and talking about not showing favoritism being humble being slow to speak these works are works but they're the fruit of one's faith now when Paul uses the phrase works this isn't always the case when he uses the word works But oftentimes when the Apostle Paul talks about works, he is talking about the works of the law. Very distinct here. The works of the law then, in Paul's mind, he's refuting false teachers that oftentimes say to the church in Galatia, the church in Rome, the church in Ephesus, that to become a Christian, you must put your faith in Christ alone plus keep the Mosaic law. You must put your faith in Christ alone plus be circumcised. And to that emphasis, Paul would say, "Uh -uh, uh-uh, 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 uh-uh. No, we are saved through faith alone, not through faith alone plus circumcision. So Paul has this emphasis of refuting the false teachers who are adding to the gospel by keeping works of the law. James is emphasizing something that is different than what Paul is emphasizing often in his letters. It is a different context. But both James and Paul are going to agree that faith, true saving faith, is always accompanied by good works. It always has a ring of authenticity and action. John Calvin, the the Genevan reformer, Calvin would say it this way, really summarizing uh, James and Paul's emphasis, it is therefore faith alone which justifies And yet, the faith which justifies is not alone, just as it is the heat alone of the sun which warms the earth. And yet, in the sun, it is not alone because it is constantly conjoined with light. Paul's emphasis, oftentimes in his letters, is upon spiritual birth. James is talking about the maturation of, of one's faith. Paul is in a lot of times a spiritual obstetrician and and James is functioning oftentimes in his letter as, as a spiritual pediatrician talking about growing up in the faith here. And so you would see when you go to a a book like Philippians chapter 2, how James and Paul, they don't contradict one another. They're they're talking about the same thing and and complementary emphases. Look how the way Paul would say this in Philippians chapter 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you also have obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, do this. What? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul's not contradicting himself himself. 
He's just talking about a different emphasis here. He's talking about working out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. You see how Paul and James, they're not contradicting one another. They're complementary emphases. And when Paul is talking about the fruit of one's faith, he's going to talk about it in a way that's very similar to what James is talking about here. So this is a theological point to consider that then moves us to a practical, point of application. And that practical point of application is just this principle, that faith without fruit is a false faith. Let me say that again, that faith without fruit is a false faith. James's point is immensely clear. It's repeated four different times. It's nuanced every time in this section of Scripture from verse 14 to verse 26, but it is repeated with a sense of trying to make this point, hear it one after another, and just this effect here before us in verse 14. What good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have works? Can that faith save him? Then in verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, it is dead. Then in verse 24, you see that a person is justified by works and not by faith alone. Then in verse 26, for as the body apart from the spirit is dead, so also faith apart from works is dead. Four times, he repeats this refrain in a way to make sure that we understand that faith and works is the heads and the tails of one coin of true saving faith. It is not enough. It is not enough to know the truth of the gospel. The truth must lead to action lest you don't know the truth. When a seed is planted and a seed is watered and that seed receives the nutrients of the, <clears throat> of the sun, that seed sprouts and it grows And so when the seed of salvation is truly planted in your heart and in my heart, so growth occurs, fruit is produced. The fruit is the work of a changed life. Now, of course, as a Christian, you are still a sinner. Of course, as a Christian, we are not perfect this side of heaven. And of course, as a Christian, Satan, the world, our flesh, it works against that spiritual maturation. So so there are times that we revert back to the old self. There are times we live under our calling. There are times that we give in to the flesh. There are times. So James isn't saying that to be a Christian, you must be perfect. That is not the point of James. But James is emphasizing that you can know facts about the gospel. You can know facts about the Bible and not truly be possessed by the God of the Bible. Now, this is an important emphasis. Uh, He he says it this way in James chapter 2, verse 19. You believe that God is one. You do well. Guess what? Even the demons believe that, and they shudder. The demons believe in God. They give intellectual assent to his existence, but they are not believers. James gives this example as as one, an extreme example to be able to put a point in your heart and in my heart that while these demons will be condemned to the pits of hell for eternity, they believe in God. So your belief in God If it is not accompanied by life change, if it is just intellectual understanding of God, then we're misunderstanding what the gospel is. So what does this mean? Well, you can be keenly interested in theology and not be a Christian. You can win a round of Bible jeopardy and not be a Christian. You could have repeated intellectually, even with your mouth, you could have repeated the words of a sinner's prayer and still not understand the claims of the gospel and not have trusted Christ because the longest distance between one's understanding and one's acceptance of the gospel is the distance between their head and their heart. And if it hasn't moved from your head to your heart, it will never make its way to your hands in life change. And there's some emphases within the modern Christian movement that talk about salvation as just a theology test. 
if you know this and 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 know this, then you're a Christian. But the problem with that is the demons know that. Satan knows that. So it is not just intellectual assent of the truths of the gospel here. There's several years ago, several years ago where George Barna did this poll. And I'm, I'm always skeptical about, I, I very rarely quote polls because it just seems that you can just get polls to prove anything. But this is a really interesting poll. And I think there is some truth, but I'll, I'll save you all the statistical analysis of it. The, the point of the poll in Barna's uh, just polling was just this, that he said, based upon his polling, that the activities of Christians were statistically the same as the activities of non-Christians around these areas. So there was no statistical difference between non-Christians and Christians in his polling when it came to gambling, visiting uh, pornographic websites, There was no statistical difference between Christians and non-Christians, between stealing and slander, consulting a medium or a psychic, abusing someone, using illegal or non-prescription drugs, lying, consuming enough alcohol to be considered legally drunk, that there was no substantial statistical difference between Christians and non-Christians in any of those activities, except for one, and that was Christians were 10% more unlikely, or or non-Christians were 10% more likely to recycle than non-Christians. So non-Christians recycle more than Christians. That that was the statistical difference that was substantial. Now, now what do we say about this? What what should we reflect upon? Now, it, it depends upon the sampling. It depends upon where the sampling is done. But I think there is a truth here. That there are many people that claim the title of Christians who know not the God of the Bible in their heart. That there are many people who profess with their mouth that they are believers whose faith hasn't possessed them. There are many people who profess faith who don't possess faith. We need to hear this in Birmingham, Alabama, that that there are many people who profess faith who do not possess faith. I guess it was two years ago. It was the Memorial Day week, and we were able, in the midst of baseball, to to get all of the kids in a, a vehicle and drive up to Chicago. So it was the first time we as a family had all gone to a, a Cubs game. And so Jonathan, my youngest at this time, was about four years old. And so we got there early. We toured Wrigley Field. And we were there so early that some of the Cubs were on the field taking some grounders and that kind of thing. And at that time, Chris Bryant, the third baseman, MVP Chris Bryant, was on the field. And so I was just kind of telling my four-year-old, he was sitting next to me, I was saying, well, that's Chris Bryant. Jonathan. And he goes, "Uh uh-huh. And I said, he's from Las Vegas. Uh Uh-huh. He was the minor league player of the year about two years ago. Uh Uh-huh. He he played baseball at at Arizona State University. Uh Uh-huh. Or excuse me, University of San Diego. Let me get my facts straight with that. So, uh uh-huh. And we just went down all through these facts about it. He plays third base for the Cubs. Uh Uh-huh. And then he looked at me after I went down all these facts and he said, Dad, when am I going to get to meet him? (laughs) When am I going to get to meet Chris Bryant? And, and what he was asking me was, is you, you know all of these things about him, but when can I actually meet him? And so what ends up happening is, for all of us, we watched the royal wedding yesterday. Many of you watched the royal wedding yesterday. And you can possess all of this information about the royalty over there, but not have a personal relationship with them. My information about the Chicago Cubs third baseman did not end in a relationship with him. I didn't have his phone number to be able to text him. Hey, listen, do you have a little bit of time at the end of the game to meet me and my son? We'd love to get your autograph. My information about him did not translate into a relationship with him. 
This is something that we need to hear and heed as a Christian, and even as those who think we might be Christians, that you can possess knowledge about God, that you can possess knowledge about Jesus, that you can possess knowledge about the Bible, that you can possess even knowledge about the facts of the gospel and not be in a true relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, how would you know that? Well, this is a conversation to have. This really isn't a four-minute application. This is a conversation to have with mature Christians, maybe parents, or maybe Lance, or Abby, or maybe it's a conversation to have with, with me over lunch at a time. But, but it is important that James is saying that faith without fruit is false faith. So let's take a couple of examples of what fruit of the Christian life would look like. One fruit of the Christian life would be a desire to confess one's sins. If you feel no sense of conviction of sin, if you you really feel no sense of being out of step with his will ever, no sense of being out of step with his word and his way, and there are consistent patterns of unconfessed sin in your life, if you're just consistently living a double life where who you are in church and who you are in private are completely different people, who you are with your family and who you are in those recesses of your life that no one knows about, and you have no sense of true remorse, no sense of conviction. It might be that you know a lot about him, but you do not truly know him. Let's talk about another work of of the faith that comes out, a fruit of the faith. The the true faith will, will lead to the fruit of the Spirit. So true, authentic faith, when the seed of salvation is planted, it it blossoms in us and it leads to the growth of love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control. Now, will any of us in this room be perfectly self-controlled? The answer is no. This side of heaven, we will not. Do you have to be perfectly self-controlled to be a Christian? The answer is no. That's why Christ came to us, because we cannot do this. In this side of heaven, we are all going to be works in progress here. We will be perfectly kind or perfectly good this side of heaven. And the answer is no. But With that said, I think it is important for you and me to ask ourselves to do a little bit of a spiritual inventory. Are we marked in our professional life and our personal life by consistent impatience? Are we marked in our personal life and our professional life by consistent unfaithfulness? If there's a consistent lack of self-control in our hearts, if discord marks our personal life and our professional life, if we feel a consistent lack of joy in our life, it very well may be that you've prayed a prayer, you've walked an aisle, you've been through the motions, you can make a 90 or above on a theology test, but while you profess faith, you do not possess faith. And so James' words are these words to us. You can know about him, but you can still not know and be known by him in a saving way. And so James calls us to a spiritual inventory, to, to take stock of the state of our soul, because this is so vitally important to understand that faith without fruit is a false faith. That faith without fruit is a false faith. My children made professions of faith when they were very young. My oldest two. And oftentimes I I, I wonder, you know, how much of this do they they understand? How old do you have to be to make a a profession of faith? What's the age of accountability in the Bible? The Bible doesn't give us that information. Can a five-year-old be saved? The answer is yes. Can a six-year-old be saved? Well, it depends on the six-year-old. It depends on the person. It depends on the environment. It depends on a lot of things. Will that six-year-old become a 26-year-old? The answer spiritually is no. That six-year-old will still have to grow up 
in the faith. But we would be remiss to not say that there are many people within the context of Baptist churches who at early ages possess knowledge about God and they equate their knowledge about God as saving trust in God. I I am fearful, and Dawson does this very well, Our children's ministry is very intentional about this, about making sure that we're walking alongside of you as parents, making sure that we don't have false professions of faith. But all of us in this room need to understand that sometimes in our desire to encourage people to to make that saving trust in Christ, we have equated understanding facts about the gospel as trusting in Jesus Christ as their Savior. And I wonder at times if one of the reasons that Christians don't look any more different than the world is oftentimes because many people who say, I am a Christian, are holding back upon a false assurance of understanding facts about the gospel and professing faith while they do not possess true saving faith. My goal here is not whatsoever to make you doubt your salvation. But my goal is to preach the truth of James chapter 2, verses 14 through 26, that is very clear that faith without fruit is a false faith. Let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your word, a word that speaks to our hearts. I pray for any person that is in this room who can look back upon their life and and see times where they've equated knowing about you as truly being known by you. I pray that all of us understand that salvation is is lordship. It It is giving over the rights of our life. It is trusting in you fully. And that when we trust in you, there is a work of the gospel that extends to our heart and to our hands. May we do a spiritual inventory. May we have those difficult conversations because it very well may be that someone in this room has, has had a false sense of security based upon their knowledge, but not truly knowing you as Lord and Savior. May may we have those good conversations, looking at the very heartbeat of, of what the gospel is and the way that it moves and shapes us as believers. It's in your name we pray. Amen.